Hi. Thank you very much. Can you see my slides? I hope so. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will start with uh, making two excuses. The first one is for not being there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my lectures were shifted by one week before, so uh, I have to be in Venice this week. Uh, the second excuse I'm going to make is that I'm not going to go too much into this, a little bit yes, because uh, a, little, a few things changed. I was supposed to uh, give this talk together with Tasha Barlow, but then uh, uh, she also had issues, so we shifted things a little bit around. So what I'm talking about today, if I can move my slides. No, I can't. Okay. What I'm talking about today is mostly what has been my cup of tea for the last 10 years or more, which is uh, proxy-based evidence of former sea level ice stands. You'll see that we get into the question um, uh, or, or into the topic uh, later later on. Uh, but most of all, uh, I am trying to answer the question I get asked more often when I meet colleagues at conferences, which is, hey, Ale, do you know of sea uh, level proxies for uh, this preferred time period of mine? Um, and I get this question because I had the luck throughout the years to work in many different places around the world and with many different people on many different time frames. So I'm kind of uh, I kind of have knowledge of stuff that happens uh, uh, in in the field. And of course, we want to know that we all uh, we are all here because of that because we know that uh, we can use these interglacials or past interglacials as a key to the future. And uh, um, this goes into the discussion of. Uh, high hand uh, scenarios or low likelihood scenarios, for example, that have been brought up by the last IPCC, uh, especially including new mechanisms of uh, ice, uh, of ice uh, um, collapse. So, but uh, basically just to remind everybody uh, what we talk about when we talk about uh, um, sea level proxies in the field, and I mean direct proxies of sea level in the field, this is what we talk about. This is a 3D model that has been done by one of my postdocs, Patrick Boyden, uh, of an outcrop in Madagascar. And this shows a very nice uh, uh, shore platform uh, to um, beach deposit sequence passing through a reef uh, development stage. And what we try to do is basically connect uh, the paleo environments to the modern ones. So we try to look at uh, the paleo shore platform. How does it relate in terms of elevation and morphology to the modern one? Um, we try to understand how uh, the components or how the different ecological parts of fossil reefs relate to the depth of modern counterparts so we can reconstruct sea level or how the stratigraphy of different beach deposits can or what the stratigraphy can tell us about uh, uh, sea level uh, uh, positions in the past. This is uh, the basics of what we do in the field and then we uh, get, we try to get samples, we have different ways to actually try to give an age to those samples, either absolute or relative age to connect things stratigraphically between sites, and then we uh, get to a reconstruction of paleo sea level um, at the time when this particular morphology was uh, active and the reef, uh, for example, was living. And of course, we should never forget that what we do as well is uh, try to work out uh, vertical land motions, which are really important because this is what differentiates from a local sea level record that we can reconstruct to, I think Andre is <laughs> came into the talk. Um, uh, from a local sea level record to a uh, global sea level record that we can reconstruct. And of course, we have to take into account these players. When we look at uh, especially passive margins, the main issue or the main things we have to take into account are, of course, glacial isostatic adjustment. And uh, uh, we understood uh, studying the Pliocene especially that we need to look into mental dynamic topography. And of course, if we look at uh, um, active margins, so no, no passive margins, but active margins, we look at, we must look at tectonics and correct for tectonics. So 
if I look back, I'm going to go a little bit uh, further back than the, than the Pleistocene, but you'll understand why after I finish my talk. If we look back at periods of interest, which are sort of slightly warmer or comparable to the present interglacial or slightly warmer than pre-industrial, we have a few different targets. And we, we all heard about those. We heard Cronis tell us about MIS-11C. Um, and these are, I think, the most interesting ones, or at least these are the ones where we have some field proxies that can tell us or can give us an idea where sea level was. So I'm going to start from very old and going towards the young. Uh, early Pliocene, a few years ago, we published uh, one of, uh, I think, the few records that there are of direct proxies of sea level records for the early Pliocene, 5 million years. This is a beautiful oyster shell bed with intertidal uh, beds in Patagonia, in Argentina. And uh, what uh, Jackie Osterman and Andrew Holiday, her PhD student, did after a couple of years was to put together a set of dynamic topography models, which are very uncertain in the area, and correct the elevations that we observed in the field. And then they started to assume, or they started to say that the global mean sea level was about 17 plus or minus six meters. So we go from 10 to 20 plus meters uh, of sea level uh, equivalent in uh, the early Pliocene, which is a number which is more or less uh, in line with what is found uh, in uh, uh, the caves of Mallorca, again, corrected for dynamic topography and uh, post-depositional tectonics. You see here a slightly younger 4, 4.3, 4.1 million years, so probably a slightly different interglacial than the one we're looking in, uh, in uh, Argentina, but still sea levels that are on the upper end of the 20 plus meters. So we go from, uh, let's say, nine, uh, I, I wouldn't take too much into account of the number three, which is a very low end, but uh, nine, 10 to 20 plus meters during the early Pliocene. We have other things uh, related to the early Pliocene. This is a um, subtidal intertidal bed contact that we found in South Africa. Uh, this is the work of Arti et al. Uh, we never corrected this for dynamic topography. So we find it at 30 meters, but most likely we would have to correct it down. That work started because we were looking together with uh, the group of Moremo in the Plyomax project. Uh, um, we were looking for mid Pliocene sea level records. So the, the early Pliocene was sort of a byproduct of that. Uh, but of course, we have mid Pliocene sea level records. Again, the caves of Mallorca give us a number which is on the 10 plus to 20 again uh, uh, meters for the around about 3 million years, 3 million years mark which is very nice to see it aligns more or less with what we have been finding uh, uh, on the US uh, East Coast. This is a work I did when I was a postdoc with Mo, uh, with Mo at, uh, at Lamont. And basically by correcting it from, um, correcting it for dynamic topography, uh, Mucha Rutnik uh, uh, said that sea level must have been about 15 meters above sea level. So lower than the early Pliocene, but still uh, quite high, above the 10 meters, 15 meters mark, more or less. We also have some records in South Africa about this. There's quite a lot uh, um, of sea level records in South Africa for the 3 million or the mid Pliocene shoreline, but we also have some records for the MIS 31, which is, I think, a very interesting uh, interglacial. It's often uh, um, called a super interglacial, and uh, it, it, it would be very interesting to know what the global mean sea level was during this period. Uh, however, there are some records. This is another paper by Sandstrom et al, where they find this MIS-31 coral reef terrace in Western Australia. Uh, but uh, these records are, have never been corrected for a dynamic topography or GIA for the matter. So we only have some local estimates, one from South Africa, one from uh, um, Western Australia, and maybe a couple more around the globe, but not a lot of... Uh, 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 not a lot of corrections there. Now we get into the topic of <laughs> of what uh, Cronis was talking about. Cronis uh, uh, pointed out that uh, sea level during MIS 11. So we are we are getting into the into the uh, Pleistocene world uh, with uh, with glacials, strong glacials and interglacials. And uh, Cronis was saying that sea level was probably in the six to thirteen. Uh, 
uh, meters mark. So the blue dots on this map are the uh, places around the world where we know of MIS-11 um, proxies, direct proxies of uh, last interglacial. Uh, oh, sorry, of MIS-11, sorry. Um, and this is what uh, Remo and Mitrovica wrote, and this is what I basically copied and pasted into the, uh, the part of the IPCC report that I wrote about uh, past interglacials or sea level during past interglacials. So uh, they just use a couple of those sites and they are three sites of those and they corrected them for glacial isostatic adjustment and then they uh, worked out this, this number. Oh, sorry, this is... Um, what happens in the field, this is a paper from Madagascar, is that most often uh, at passive margins we see that the MIS-11 reef is basically eroded into uh, by MIS-5. So uh, there is a little bit of uh, uh, superimposition if you look at passive margins between MIS-11 and MIS-5. We find MIS-11 at many sites, but it's below the MIS-5E complex, and this is, uh, of course, uh, an issue because you would have to drill unless erosion has exposed it, as it happens, for example, in this area in Madagascar. Now, I think um, it, it is very interesting for, for, this kind of, uh, for this kind of interglacial to look into slightly uplifting areas. This is uh, a sequence of, sequence of coral reef terraces in Curaçao, and there are very similar ones in Aruba and Bonaire, which are, we are working on. The elevation is not that high, so it means that we do not have uh, um, a very uh, high uplift rate. We're about 15, 20 meters above current sea level. But that uh, reef you see in the background, it's the MIS-11 complex. And the one you see in the foreground is, is the MIS-5E uh, complex. So it is basically, I think that basically these sites might give us a little bit of a better um, evidence for MIS-11 rather than uh, completely uh, stable sites or passive, passive margins. There are uh, coastal barriers, which might be of very high interesting interest, for example, here in Georgia, but I know of uh, similar coastal barriers uh, along the coast of Brazil, for example. Strangely enough, many of them have been dated uh, to MIS-7, which I think is a little bit of a problem uh, with uh, some of the dating techniques that have been, have been applied. Uh, because MIS-7 uh, is, is, uh, should be, the sea level should have been much lower than, um, uh, than, than modern, so you would need a lot of tectonics to bring them up 20 meters above the landscape. But this example, for example, in Georgia, is a coastal barrier that was dated to MIS-11, MIS and uh, it basically tells us again that sea level was uh, sort of higher, most likely, than the um, uh, than, than the MIS 5E uh, benchmark. Uh, a very interesting study, I think, and still very uh, recent, is uh, by the late Dave Roberts. Uh, uh, in 2012, they published a very convincing stratigraphy uh, looking at MIS 5E and the difference between MIS 5E and uh, uh, the last integral so, and, and MIS 11 in uh, South Africa, and they basically concluded that we are on the high end of the uh, Remo and Mitrovica, um, and the Remo and Mitrovica estimates. So MIS-11, they say, would have a sea level, would, would correspond to a sea level, which is on the 13 plus meter, uh, or say 10 plus meter range. Before I get into uh, the last thing I want to talk about, which is MIS-5E, I think uh, there are close to no records of MIS-9, which is very interesting. Many people think it peaked very close to the current uh, interglacial, so very close to zero, and this is why it has been eroded by probably successive um, interglacials. Uh, I think I have something here in Argentina. This is a place I'm working on where we have an MIS 5E barrier, we have the Pliocene that I showed you before, but in between there is something which the geochronologists tell me cannot be MIS 11. I thought it was, uh, but it could be MIS 9. So uh, stay tuned for a uh, work in progress by my PhD student who is publishing this, this record about MIS 9, which is uh, actually quite, uh, quite interesting uh, in itself. And of course, there are a bunch of um, uh, published uh, uh, coastal features 
that Mark Sidal uh, dug out, but they are not very well uh, well dated and well constrained. Ours would probably be the first one to be uh, better constrained in terms of chronology if we confirm the MIS-9 age. In this regard, I think, especially at uplifting areas such as such as the MIS-11 complex I showed you before from Curaçao and other reef areas, it, it, it is very interesting to follow um, a little bit uh, a different approach rather than uh, just uh, um, trying to find places uh, where uh, the where the, the ages come back uh, come back clean, and this is the reef modeling approach. So trying to actually um, model the reef growth. I'm thinking about places like Papua New Guinea, like the one shown here, uh, and from the modeling and the landscape, trying to understand the age of the different terraces. So we might not have perfect ages for every terrace, but we can work out the age of the terraces by comparing the observations to model reef framework. And uh, the Gelder et al. did a very nice job about this. So last five minutes I have, I'm going to get into MIS-5E. I know we are, I'm shifting probably a little bit the focus from uh, the MIS-11, but I hope uh, the, the story is sort of, the storyline is clear here. Um, this is what uh, uh, we wrote in uh, the IPCC, IPCC report, and this is, I think, if I, if I pulled the audience for um, uh, MIS 5E C level uh, uh, estimates, this is what uh, uh, I will get from, I think, all of you. So <laughs> we think that uh, with medium confidence, the global mean sea level was within 5 to 10 meter higher than present during the last interglacial. That was high confidence before, and I thought uh, a little bit to put into the IPCC this medium confidence because I knew there was something happening. This is a study that was published right after the IPCC, but of course I knew of that when, <laughs> when I was writing the IPCC, and there was a lot of discussion about this. Uh, uh, Dyer et al. 2021, he uh, we uh, took into account different uh, uh, sea level index point across, points across the Bahamas, then corrected them for dynamic topography and GIA. And uh, we concluded that uh, uh, peak last interglacial sea level was between 1.2 and did not exceed 5.3 meters. Now, before you uh, make a revolution, I will tell you a couple of things. First of all, many people is asking me, what about the Seychelles record? And I would, uh, I, I, I will uh, um, hope I have the possibility to discuss with this with Andrea and other colleagues, because uh, what Andrea published uh, is uh, very uh, interesting and still very relevant. Um, so Andrea um, in the Seychelles uh, uh, put together a record and then she corrected it for GIA and she obtained a sea level that was around uh, peak sea level for the last inflation about seven meters above modern. The key is which models you choose because Andrea was using Lambex model to correct for GIA and this will correct the shoreline up and then uh, she will adjust for the fingerprints. So uh, other calculations are falling in there. But uh, uh, a paper of Dandy et al. showed that if you choose a different model, you actually correct the shoreline down. So bring, you bring it down from the seven meters. And dynamic topography models would actually ops, would actually show, I need to go back, sorry. And dynamic topography models would actually show that you still need to correct it down by uh, about half a meter. Sorry about that. Um, there's even more to that. So there is even more possible correcting corrections that would bring the shorelines from the last glacial down because just yesterday a paper I uh, came out in, um, communication cert environment that basically says that you cannot discount or you cannot discard the fact that reefs themselves, as they grow during an interglacial, they have a weight uh, that produces a GIA response. We tried that on the Great Barrier Reef and the result is that this weight causes about 40 centimeters of, um, uh, of uh, subsidence that needs to be corrected. So there's again uh, something which, uh, which, which is, uh, uh, going on here. I think, uh, uh, so many people is asking me, should we take this news estimate of the Dyer et al. paper for as good ones? And my answer is always, uh, 
not yet, because we need to confirm this by applying the same method that Blake used at different areas. But I, I want to, uh, and, and the Wallis database, which I put together throughout my ERC, is giving us the possibility to do that. Right now, we are extracting the data at passive margins and rerunning uh, Blake's approach and corrections. Um, to to basically um, to basically be able to uh, to repeat uh, repeat that uh, that those calculations and see where we end up in terms of global mean sea level in the last Inter glacier. Uh, I'm not gonna get into sea level oscillations uh, uh, during the last Inter glacial because I have no time, but I will just point out that a paper was just out uh, again a couple of days ago in quaternary science reviews where Jackie Osterman, Oana Dumitru and Blake Dyer try for the first time, I think, to um, look at the oscillations by doing a fingerprinting of the different ice sheets. I haven't had time to read it. I knew of this, but I didn't have time to read it, uh, uh, to read it through. But this is a very interesting and, and relevant one. And so what? I'm going to use the last minute I have to tell you What's the point here? Um, I think it's all connected. I think it's very important to look at past sea level changes with a broad uh, uh, perspective because we need, for example, the Pliocene to, to uh, keep working to improve dynamic topography because this is, the, this is where the game of dynamic topography is played, but those corrections are all also reflecting into younger interglacial. Uh, interglacials. MIS 11, I think there are enough sites globally to attempt uh, a, more robust, a more robust inversion for global mean sea level than previously done, the Raymo and Mitrovica one, which did not take into account uh, dynamic topography, which we have understood. It's a big player when we talk about uh, hundreds of thousands of years of, uh, of Earth history and uplift or subsidence. MIS-9, uh, I would love to know of more sites around the globe. So if anyone has some ideas about this, I will be uh, eager to hear about this. And uh, MIS-5e, I would uh, basically say that it is possible that the currently accepted MIS peak, MIS-5e peak sea level is overestimated. But again, dynamic topography and GIA are key. And so we go back to the Pliocene again. So, Thank you very much for this. Uh, I hope uh, I did not disappoint you by providing a slightly different overview than probably what you expected. Uh, these are all the collaborators who helped me throughout uh, the, this project or different projects I had. And I'm going to leave this up for discussion. Thank you. Hi. Ha. Um, so gut feeling uh, is probably no. So what I'm what I'm saying uh, a lot of a lot of colleagues is uh, for an MIS-11 reef, if I'm lucky, I can give you a decent enough U series to be sh to be reasonably sure it's MIS-11. We are we are dealing with the end of a scale sort of uh, sort of dating there, and we are dealing with most often with calcitic corals, so it's it's very difficult to get out an age. Um, so. In my opinion, unless we find something very pristine, especially in terms of corals, it might be very difficult. I'm, I'm not sure something could be worked out uh, with um, uh, exposure ages, but that I'm not really too, uh, too skilled to, to basically tell you about it. But I think uh, uh, one key uh, is exactly what I said about the reef modeling. So adding what we know about reef growth in, into models that, that are available and trying to actually work out, you know, how long, for example, the MIS-11 peak should be to actually build the reef 
build a, a, a reef as large as the ones we we see in the record. So there, there's something, I think, in the combination of these two approaches. Hi, Cronist. <laughs> well, uh, well, <laughs> well. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm discussing this a lot with Jackie. Uh, actually, there's there's lots of emails with Jackie. I think, uh, 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 strangely enough, the the main issue right now seems to be, or you know, the the main roadblock seems to be uh, the GIA prediction because we have the one that uh, uh, G uh, Jerry Mitrovica did with uh, with Moremo a few years back. But probably would need to be sort of re, um, you know, uh, redone uh, with with uh, slightly more ice models. And of course, you know, any GIA prediction we have to uh, rely on ice histories. And this we get into the, you know, uh, into the the ice history before MIS 11. Um, on the other side, I'm pretty confident that at least a few sites, MIS 11 uh, dynamic topography might be actually quite well, uh, especially in South Africa. Uh, might be quite well constrained. So we, we are doing it. <laughs> but uh, the first, I think there's there's this, you know, we need to improve the GIA uh, or we need to, to basically work out the GIA. And Jackie told me that this might be a bit of a longer, a bit of a longer uh, endeavor. <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, it's not a completely losing battle. I mean, it's it's a sometimes it might be a very frustrating uh, uh, experiment, but I think the the key is really into what uh, uh, into the approach Blake is using. So, which is what we are we are trying to bring into into you know more sites around the world, not only to use one site or just one uh, single locations, but to use transects. So you would actually realize the. Uh, the gradients that the GIA would create across across long spatial scales. So that might that helps actually. That helps uh, you know ruling out some uh, some you know completely odd GIA predictions that are not working. And it also helps. Uh, I think uh, this is something we're also uh, doing to look at, especially for the mental uh, the mental properties, to look at the um, the Holocene. Let's say so. Uh, if in the same area you have a, a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, late Holocene uh, sea level history, you can actually start tuning your your mental um, your mental properties to a certain degree, and that that solves already another part of the problem, which is the what creates basically the difference between the predictions in the Seychelles, between the Dendi et al. and the Lambeck, together with the MIS six uh, different different extension and location of the ice. Uh, I'm not sure it's a completely losing battle to, to you know, it might be. Um, I look, I skimmed it. Uh, I skimmed it very quickly last night because I, I received it last night. Uh, I think they have uh, a, a caveat saying it, it, you know, very similar to what has been published in, in Dyer et al. So above two, but below five. I'm not sure they, or I probably they do, but uh, uh, I, 
I think there's a caveat in there in the conclusions by saying that uh, it should be below five at some point or in some parts of the paper. Although I'm, uh, although I'm, I'm co-author of one on one of those papers, the Dyer et al. I would definitely say, and this is what I say to to every colleague asking, uh, this is one area. We are, you know, doing the same approach in different areas. By the looks of it, it looks like uh, uh, we are getting, we are hitting similar numbers, but uh, I, I can't speak definitively because things are being analyzed right now. Hi. Look, uh, it's already very hard and very tentative for MIS 5e. I, to be honest, I would say that that for MIS 11, is, it would be very difficult. Uh, at least from the, the direct proxies point of view, uh, we come back to the first question that Emily had. You would need to get very good a very good idea of where, in terms of time, so at, at what time the the sea level proxies we see are. Often we assume they, they formed at the peak, but that's an assumption. That's, that's not something clear. At least in MIS 5e, we have, uh, thanks to UC series dating, for example, or, or OSL dating, we, we can disentangle between early or late in the interglacial. And this is what can help us to, you know, look at Greenland versus Antarctica, for example. But MIS 11 without, I mean, we're, we we're flying half blind, basically. I hope I answered your question. Uh, not sure. Uh, okay, uh, so wait, I did something with my screen. Okay, there we go. Um, I, I, you know, between different interglacials is a bit, dif a bit difficult because, uh, well, if you look at the Pliocene, for example, in Argentina and the modern or the 5e shells, there's huge differences because you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, different species living at the time, so different warmth. Uh, this is well known, no? uh, different um, uh, waters that have different... Um, uh, different temperatures, host different species, etc. So there's a different biodiversity. Um, I'm not sure if I could tell anything from my kind of proxies from uh, in terms of salinity, especially between different interglacials. So you know, 5e and 11, for example, because the the MIS 11 reefs are very sketchy in terms of preservation. So you see some corals, but you cannot really. Uh, make an ecological map of the reef or make a, make a, a educated guess about what was the ecology of the reef. What we're doing uh, with a project that is funded by the German Science Foundation uh, um, uh, that is called Frozen in Time, we are comparing the MIS 5e reefs in the IB, ABC islands to the modern ones. So we're looking at what are the differences in terms of species composition, so purely ecological point of view between the modern and the fossil. And I can tell you, I mean, we are crunching the numbers again, but I can tell you the differences are huge. So there are major, uh, I think, ecological shifts between the last interglacial and today, even in an area where temperature, water temperature changed, but not as much, most likely. So I, you know, what that means in terms of uh, uh, global uh, um, climate, I'm not sure, but that's interesting, I think. So when you have huge acroporas on the fossil reef, so, and I, I mean acroporas as big as me, and no acroporas in the modern reef or barely no reef in the modern, that's, that's a quite striking difference. Not, I'm sure I didn't answer your question, but I'm sorry. 